to thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I want to thank you so much for the great uh, degree of love that you pour on us, for the grace that we get to experience in Christ and the victory that we get to experience in Christ, not based on our own works, Lord, but just simply based on your will, your plan, your purpose, your character, your grace. Lord, this morning as we dive into your word, we ask that you cause what is written here on these pages to to come alive for us. Your word is so beautiful. Your word is living and active. Lord, help us to be able to understand your word. Help us to know exactly what you would have to say to us this morning. Lord, help us to know this morning that we really do love you, that you have produced this great love within us. And thank you so much for everything that you're doing, not only here at Grace Baptist Church, not only in this community, but around the world. Around the world. Lord, we love you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, and so this is a question, the question we're considering this morning. Uh, how do I know that I love God? How do I know that I am a disciple? Another way we could phrase this question is this. How can I know that I am saved? Uh, that I am indeed going to be with Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. How can I know? This is a question uh, that many, many, many uh, believers ask themselves, particularly people who have uh, grown up in church and who have known Jesus from a very young age. Uh, get to the point and we ask the question, how can I know that I'm actually saved? How can I know I actually belong to Jesus? How can I know I love Jesus? How can I know that I am a Disciple. We're going to be in Acts chapter 17, if you'd like to make your way there, verses 10 through 15. Um, before we get there, I want to read a passage in Matthew, and I'm just going to read this for you. You don't have to turn here. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21. These are the words of Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And on that day... Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. And so we have this, this thing that Jesus has said in the back of our minds. There are people who are preaching in the name of Jesus. There are people who are doing all sorts of good things in Jesus' name. There are all sorts of people who want to go to heaven or the place that they perceive as, as heaven. And when they get there, by Jesus' own words, there are many people who will be turned away because Jesus did not know them. And if Jesus himself is teaching something like this, maybe we, as a local church, ought to ask the question that Jesus is answering. How do I know, know that I love Jesus? How do I know that I am in love with God? How do I know that I am a disciple? How do I know that I am going to be with Jesus forever? Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 starting in verse 10. This is part of Paul's journey as he, is, um, as he is on his missionary journeys, sharing the gospel, planting churches. This is a part of Paul's journey, and we're going to dive into this together and see uh, what God is working out in this missionary journey. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 10. As soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas away to Berea, Upon arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. The people here were more noble than those in Thessalonica, since they received the word with eagerness 
and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Consequently, many of them believed, including a number of prominent Greek women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been pro proclaimed by Paul at Berea, they came there too, agitating and upsetting the crowds. Then the brothers and sisters immediately sent Paul away to go to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed on there. Those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving instructions for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, they departed. They departed. Uh, as we dive into this text of Scripture and think about this question, how can I know that I'm a disciple? How can I know that I belong to Jesus? I want to look at this in three parts. Uh, first of all, I want to look at the nature of our relationship with Christ, with the God of the universe. Secondly, I want to look at the nature of religiosity. Um, third, I want to look at the very nature of God's love, uh, the love that he has for us and produces within us. Uh, first, the nature of our relationship. The nature of our relationship. Um, guys, it is so clear in the text of Scripture that we are absolutely sinful and absolutely depraved people. Um, the world we live in is broken. Uh, we sin against the God of the universe. We do things that are wrong. Yet, Jesus chooses to save a people for himself, even though all people have sinned against the God of the universe. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, which we read in the introduction uh, this morning, um, said that there will be people who prophesy in my name, who drive out demons in my name, who preach in my name, who will not be with me forever. In fact, when they tout all of these things, when they say, Jesus, didn't we do all of these things for you? Didn't we perform these good works for you? I will have to say to them, I do not know you. Depart from me, you law breakers. We hear often described when somebody is trying to describe the, uh, the Christian faith that it's, it's about a relationship and not about religion. Um, I think that might be a, a good way to approach the definition of Christianity, trying to describe the Christian faith, um, but I also think it's a little bit misleading because Christianity is a religion. Uh, it is a religious faith. It is a belief system uh, centered around some sort of religious practice, and for us that's belief in Jesus Christ. That is the religious belief. Every worldview, every belief system in the world is a religious belief system. And so I, I want to move away from this language of trying to describe Christianity as a relationship and not a religion. Instead, uh, maybe we should say uh, something to this effect, that, that Christianity is not me trying to earn my way. Instead, it is about the relationship that I have with Jesus. And Jesus does produce good works within us. The religious aspect of Christianity is important. But that is not specifically what Christianity is about. It is really about a relationship. Consider the language in Matthew chapter 7, which we read earlier. People, people were working so that they could be with Jesus. People were doing things in Jesus' name. Um, People were trying to earn their own salvation. And Jesus had to say, depart from me, you law breakers. And so our faith, it is not about us earning our way. And I think we know this. It's not about us earning our way. In fact, there's no way we can possibly do that. It is about relationship. Jesus had to say, I don't know you. Depart from me. What it takes for us to be with Jesus forever Endeavor, 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 endeavor. It's not that we do this thing that pleases him. It's not that we do this thing that somehow makes us righteous. It's not that we uh, pray enough or go to church enough or help homeless people enough. No, what gets us into eternity with Jesus is specifically that Jesus knows us. 
specifically that Jesus knows us. In this text of scripture in Acts, uh, Paul and his team of missionaries, they get to this uh, city, this town, Berea. Um, Before this, they were in Thessalonica. They experienced a lot of persecution. Uh, There was a group of Jews who uh, turned uh, the whole city into basically a mob against this missionary team, drove them out. So as they're coming out of Thessalonica, they go into uh, Berea, and the people in Berea were different. Uh, They were open-minded, some translations will say. Uh, Some translations will say they were noble-minded or of noble character or that they were noble. Uh, The Greek word there uh, literally means uh, that they were brought into understanding or prosperity or they were brought into a state uh, to where they acted well. Um, And so these people were noble-minded. They were open-minded. And here's what they did when Paul and his missionary team came in and Paul was preaching and he was sharing the message of Jesus and the people of Berea were hearing it. Uh, They didn't turn the whole city against Paul and Paul's missionary team. Uh, No, instead, they opened up the scriptures and they began examining the scriptures to see if these things that Paul was saying were true. Of course, they found out that they were true according to the scriptures and many of them came to believe in Jesus Christ. Here's what I noticed about these Bereans, uh, these uh, people in this city that are listening to Paul as a missionary. Um, they loved truth, and they loved the Word of God. They were coming together in community and donating their time, devoting their time, expending their time to learn the things of God. They spent time examining the Scriptures to be sure that, that they knew what was true and that they believed what was true. If I uh, am with my family, um, you might ask the question, how would I know that I love my son or that I love my wife? Uh, The answer is not, well, I do all of this stuff for them. Um, No, the answer is, I devote my time and I spend my time with them. Um, How many fathers do we have that spend all of their time working Uh, to provide for their family, um, but still the family falls apart and still they grow apart and still love fails. It wasn't, it's not about the father doing all of this stuff for his family. It's about the father spending time with his family. Um, You know that I love my son because I spend time with my son. You know that I love my wife because I spend time with my wife and I I talk about my wife and I try to, to please My wife, we live in a very real relationship. We know that we we love God then when we spend time with God. For the Bereans, we know that they love truth because they spent time trying to discover what was true. We know that they love the Word of God because they devoted their time to searching through the Scriptures to be sure that what what some missionary team coming into their town and saying to make sure that all of that was, was true. Love is symbolized by the time we spend doing the things that we do. It is symbolized by the time we spend doing the things that we do. Jesus uh, has some things to say about this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus says this, Where your treasure is, There your heart will be also. Time for us is a great treasure, is it not? Um, We only have so much time on this earth. Every minute that we live, we are expending time. Every minute we spend doing something, we are expending our time. We spend our time, expend our time doing the things that we love. In John chapter 14, verses 15 through 18, Jesus also says this, If you love me, you will keep my commands and I will ask the father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it does not see him or know him. But you do know him 
because he remains with you and will be in you. And I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. These are the words of Jesus. How do we know that Jesus actually loves us? Because he cares enough to spend time with us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit who abides in us, who dwells in us, who is with us all of the time. How do we know that God loved Adam and Eve? He walked with them in the garden. How do we know that God loved Israel? Jesus would show up and he would shepherd his people through the Old Testament. We know that God loves us because he spends his time with us. He spends his time with us. And so what I gleaned from this is that we show exactly what we love when we spend our time doing the different things that we do in this life and on this earth. In the same way, we can, uh, we can tell that we, what we don't love by what we don't spend our time doing. So if I were to say with my mouth that I love my family, but I was never with my family, you could tell that I was speaking without acting, that I don't really mean what I'm saying. If we say that we, we love God and we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, but, but we're never with our brothers and sisters in Christ, we can, we can tell that we don't really love our brothers and sisters in Christ that much. We say we love God, but we're not spending our time looking into His Word then uh, we can tell that we don't really love Jesus Christ that much. If we say we love truth and we love the very word of God, but that is not where we spend our time, we can tell that we are lying or we have fooled ourselves into thinking that we follow Jesus, but we, we haven't actually loved him, we haven't actually followed him. We might be like those people in, in Matthew chapter 7 who are like, Lord, Lord, didn't we go to church in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we sing praises in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we put money in your offering plate? And Christ would have to say to us, depart from me, I never knew you. The objective here is that we are known by Christ, that we know Christ. And he loves us enough to spend time with us. And as he loves us, he produces this love within us that causes us to want to spend time with him. Not only here as a local body of believers, as a local church family, but also in our homes, when we do everything that we do. Speaking of loving the Word of God, M.D. Wilson, and I just want to read this for you. M.D. Wilson describes uh, how just how beautiful God's Word is, and we don't usually think about God's Word in these terms, but let me just read this for you. I knew what God was saying he gave me eyes so that I might see him say it. He gave me ears so that I could pick up rhythms and clatters and rhymes. My skin can tighten, teased by his breath, and send up bumps. My tongue can taste these words, the water, the pine needles, even the log that held me. But I cannot say them. We have given them names, shortcutting them with smaller sounds, sounds that fit in our mouths. Tree, I say, and you know what I mean. You see one in your mind, or glance out your window, and remember the much-needed pruning. Tree, God says, and there is one. But he doesn't say the word tree. He says the tree itself. He needs no shortcut. He's not merely calling one into existence, though his voice creates. His voice is its existence. That thing in your yard, that mangy apple or towering spruce, that thing is not the referent of his word. It is his word and its referent. And if he were to stop talking it, it would cease to be there. How humbling is this? Uh, to know that God is the sustainer of the, of the entire world, of the existence of all things, of my very existence, that if, if God, the God of the universe, was to stop speaking, I would go out of existence. That all of creation, when we, when we look into the beauty of creation, that it is the word of God speaking it into existence, speaking its sustenance. God's word is so beautiful. How can we not love 
this? How can we not go home and not devote our time to looking into the two-dimensional word that God has given us for our understanding? How can we not step outside into our gardens or into the woods or, or at the lake or travel to the ocean and not just see God's glory everywhere in all of creation? The things that we love, we devote our time to. And we are always learning something new. Every day I get to learn more about the mercies and the grace of God. Every day I get to learn more about the beauty of the God of the universe. And it comes from the most unexpected place. I pick up my son in the morning, and there he is, teaching me something new and beautiful and wonderful about the God of the universe. My, my son can't speak. He's not trained in theology. He's almost four months old, okay? He can't read the Bible. He can't exegete the scriptures. He can't read me a book or recommend a book that I haven't read before. He can't do any of this stuff. Yet I, I look to my son, like yesterday, when I looked at my son, and my thought was, he cannot provide anything for himself. My wife and I have to completely sustain him and his existence. There is nothing he can do to stay alive. There is nothing he can do to get food for himself. There is nothing he can do to climb into bed and fall asleep in a safe position. Nothing. I must be like this with God, the God of the universe. My son teaches me beautiful and wonderful things about our Lord. Everybody I meet can teach me something new about our Lord. There's no way I... I can possibly know everything. And Paul wrote about that in the book of Philippians. He said, I don't consider myself to have arrived. I'm still on this journey, and we are all still on this journey. What love does this inspire within us for the God of the universe, that he would sustain us like this, that he would teach us like this in every arena, every aspect of life, that he would give us his word to learn from, that he would give us time to devote to the things that we love. God is so wonderful. So wonderful. We eagerly, eagerly donate our time to the things that we love. We eagerly devote our time to the things that we love. Secondly, I want to look at um, the nature of religiosity in the world today. The Bereans uh, were not the only group present in this passage of Scripture. Um, there were also the people from Thessalonica who formed this mob, who chased this missionary team out of the uh, city. Before they got to Berea, there was great persecution in Thessalonica, and there was a mob chasing them uh, because they were preaching the words of God. In Acts chapter 17, I want to notice a couple uh, of characteristics uh, about this mob, these people in Thessalonica, uh, the religious people of the day, the persecutors. One, in verse chapter 5, uh, we see that these people were both religious and jealous, but the Jews became jealous, and they brought together some wicked men from the marketplace formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. So the people who were wrapped up in their religiosity, the Jews who were um, concerned with this works-based righteousness, uh, they formed a mob and tried to drive these people out of the city, or I believe they were uh, actually seeking to kill Paul and Paul's missionary team. Um, and they wanted to uh, squelch or quell this this message of grace and message of hope and message of love, the message that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the message that people are saved only by grace and through faith. Uh, they wanted their works-based system. Their world was being flipped upside down by preaching about Christ. And so they, the religious people, 
became jealous and formed a mob and became violent. Verse 6, when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here too, and Jason has welcomed them. They started complaining. They became a a people who complained about everything. They uh, very rashly started offering up false accusations uh, about Paul and Paul's missionary team and about Jason who just let this missionary team uh, stay in his house. Um, They were religious. They were jealous. And they were also violent, complaining, um, offering up false accusations. In verse 8, The crowd and the city officials who heard these things, they were upset. In verse 13, But when the Jews from Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed at Berea, they came there too, agitating and upsetting the crowds. They were also quarrelsome, starting fights that didn't necessarily need to happen, starting conflicts that didn't necessarily need to happen. This is the difference brothers and sisters, between someone who loves God and someone who practices mere religiosity. The person who loves God seeks understanding. The person who is merely religious is quarrelsome, doesn't really care what anyone else has to to say. The person who loves God listens first and then speaks. The person who is merely religious is quick to speak and slow to listen. The person who loves God is less concerned with self and more concerned with discovering the truth of God, more concerned with looking to the Scriptures. In fact, we care about it so much that we want to devote our time to discovering the truths given to us by the God of the universe. The person who is merely religious will just assume that they know exactly what is right, exactly the way we need to do things, and that it will please them instead of being pleasing to the God of the universe. There is a great difference just in the attitude, the character of those who love God genuinely and those who are merely religious but don't love God or love Christ at all. There is a huge difference. So we examine our lives then, keeping these differences in mind. What do we spend our time doing? Time is precious. Time is a jewel. Whatever we spend our time doing, that reveals exactly what we love in the depths of our hearts. Do we love God? Do we spend time with Him? Do we love our brothers and sisters in Christ? Do we spend time with Him? Do we love truth? Do we seek first understanding? Are we quick to listen? When I am with my family, do I... Do I care what they have to say or am I domineering? This says a lot about the love that I have. When I am at church, do I look forward to having lunch afterwards so much that I stop paying attention halfway through the service? <laughs> says a lot about the love that I have. We've got macaroni cooking at home, y'all. It's going to be awesome. It's crock pot macaroni. This is the first time we're trying it. We've got some garlic knots to go along with it. It's going to be awesome. That'd be awesome. We're probably going to have leftovers tonight. Amen. What, what do we spend our time doing? Are we the religious person or the person who is, I should say this because we're all religious, I should say this, the person who is so wrapped up in religiosity that we want to cut a service short when the Holy Spirit is moving or when God has something to say, or that we, like most Americans who consider themselves to be mature Christians today, uh, do we define that Christianity by having a a five-minute devotional in the morning or in the afternoon at lunchtime and then spending 15 minutes in prayer a day? What we spend our time doing reveals exactly what we love. If 
if I love my job more than I love my family, it comes out in where I spend my time. If I love myself more than I love my brothers and sisters in Christ, it comes out in how I spend my time. If we love our community, we will spend time in our community. If we love our church, we will spend time in our church. If we love Christ, we will be an active part of the body of Christ, and we will devote our time to doing, doing just that. Doing just that. Third, the nature of God's love. As we have already mentioned, we are completely depraved. And here is what I mean by that. We, we are unable to produce love for God in us. We are way more concerned with what people think about us. We are worried about what people think about us. We are uh, worried about catching our favorite TV show. We are worried about having time uh, to do our hobbies. Uh, We are worried about putting food on the table for our families. We are worried about making enough money. We are worried about all of these things that life has to offer. And we devote our time to this worry. It is our natural disposition. Is what we automatically turn to. I have to do and do and do and do and do. I have this mental to-do list every day when I wake up, and I need to work through that. I need to be doing these things. I thank the Lord every day for His grace. This to-do list that we make for ourselves, our being worried about all of this stuff that we are doing, um, in order to be uh, pleasing to God, I have to do this. I have to show up at church. I have to sing songs. I, I need to uh, do this quiet time so that I can check it off my list and be, be pleasing to God. I need to pray before each meal so that I can be pleasing to God. We do this in our minds. We do it every day. I have to be a good preacher so I can serve God well. False. Well, serve God well, maybe, but not to be pleasing to Him. It is God who produces love within us. To say anything else would be to declare or proclaim this works-based righteousness. To say we need to spend a certain amount of time doing this and this and this and this and this would be to proclaim a works-based righteousness. And then I look at this video, the video that we watched before the service, and I see what God is doing, and I see or hear about a group of people that loves God so much that they are in a single room for 14 hours learning about what God is doing and praying, praying, praying for those who don't have the same freedoms that they do. It just breaks me. Because here in the United States, we don't don't see this. We reveal a whole lot about the love that we have. And if, if this thing were to be a works-based system, I would stand before you condemned today. I would be destined for a place called hell. Because I can't produce that kind of love within me. I just can't. I cannot, cannot do it. Can't do it at all. In John, John chapter 14, Jesus says this. We love, or John says this, we love because he first loved us. That is it. That is the only way this thing happens. We we love because God first loved us. That is grace. That is absolute grace. Sunday school this morning, we, we learned about Uh, Mary and Martha. Actually, the lesson was about Lazarus, but here I want to read uh, to you about Mary and Martha. In Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. While they were traveling, he, Jesus, entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said, was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, and she came up and asked, Lord, 
Don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. Lord, I'm doing all of these things for you because you're here at my house and I need to serve you well. Tell Mary to get up and help me do stuff for you. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing, one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from her. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to what Jesus had to say. How did she show that she loved Jesus? Time. Spent time with him. Listen to what he had to say. Why would it be any different for anybody else? We concern ourselves with doing so, so many things. Jesus' desire is that we sit at his feet and learn from him. That we give our time, as precious as it is, to the God of the universe. This means a lot when we think about discipleship, particularly in the local church. There are so many churches who, uh, for instance, will separate the children and the youth from the rest of the body and have a youth service going on over here and a regular service going on uh, in the main auditorium. Um, We'll have different classes for all of the different age groups. Uh, And in moderation, there's nothing wrong with that. But when we separate one generation from another, what are we saying? We're implying, hey, we don't love you because we're not spending time with you because we don't want you to come and spend time with us. We're saying, you over there, you're not part of our church. How beautiful it is when we all come together and we all spend time together and we are involved with more church instead of less and every generation gets to be involved and that, that speaks love and it speaks life to people. To know that I love you enough that I want to invest my time in you. And that you want to invest your time in me. And that together we are investing our time in being with Jesus who loved us first. Who loved us first. God's love is not based on works. It is grace. It is absolute grace. These are the three things I want us to to walk away with today. One, we eagerly give our time to the things that we love. We eagerly give our time to the things that we love. So if you question, do I love Jesus? Look at how much time you're spending with him and with the people of Christ. We eagerly give our time to the things we love. Mere religiosity does not show love for God. Mere religiosity does not show love for God. And three, God's love is not based on our works. And thank Him for that. Thank Him for that. We eagerly give our time to the things that we love. Mere religiosity does not show our love for God. And God's love, God's love is not based on our works. 